What is going on, everybody? How we doing? Welcome back to another edition of the In The Round podcast. My name is Matt Burrill, and uh, we are on camera now. You can find our episodes on YouTube. We have got Mr. Matt McElwain recording these episodes. And uh, today for our first video episode, uh, really cool guest, we have got Miss Meg Patrick. And uh, we talk about all kinds of stuff. She really opens up with us and uh, tells us about her thoughts on some different things, talks about the music, uh, what she's got coming up, and uh, yeah, all kinds of cool shit. So y'all stick around for that conversation. Before we get into that, i got to tell y'all about our sponsors. First and foremost, our friends at Whale Tail Media, our partners in this, Whales, BZ, Gracie, the whole crew, our content specialists. Uh, we love them dearly. Make sure you check them out, whaletailmedia.com. Second, we have got our friends at Saxman Studios, Grady Saxman and the boys over there. Great supporters in the scene. If you're looking to get something recorded here in Nashville, Tennessee, hit those boys up. They are very good at what they do. They work hard, and uh, they will have your back as an artist here in Nashville, Tennessee. And last but certainly not least, our friends in the green world. That's right. We're talking about Andrew and Matt and the team at Trailside CBD emporium trailside wellness emporium they are the shit they've been behind us for a long time now and um, they specialize in anything cbd anything hemp and of course that tasty legal delta 8 thc and we got a promo code with them you use promo code itr at checkout you save 20 percent on your order anything you can smoke vape eat they even got shit for your dogs. Go check them out. TrailsideCBD.com. Use the promo code ITR at checkout and you save yourself 20% off. Now, without further ado, we're going to get into the episode. Y'all get ready for this one. We have Meg Patrick on the In The Round podcast. A little clap. Well, how the hell are you doing today, Miss Meg Patrick? Uh, well... I got to write a song today, um, so yeah, that's pretty dope. I like I like doing that. <laughs> nice, that's good. You got to experience some fun Nashville traffic that we all get to. Oh yeah, that was definitely my favorite part of the day. <laughs> you got Absolutely. stuck on the damn train. Yeah, I was like, well, after I got off the interstate, I was like, okay, I'm so close, and then I waited forever to turn onto this street, and like nobody was letting anybody in, and then finally, I was like, all right. This next time, it's, it's going to happen. And then I see that there's a train. I was like, of course there is. <laughs> so <laughs> It goes like that. How long have you been living here in Nashville? Uh, it's been almost five years. Almost five years? Damn. Yeah. Okay, so you've gotten, you've had your plenty of taste of Nashville traffic yeah. and all that shit. Yeah, I mean, luckily, I've, I've never lived super far out of town, so I, I don't have to experience it on a daily basis. Just, you know, for special occasions, like coming to see you guys, you know. Hey, hey there you go. Yeah, coming, coming over here to the east side. Um, yep. But, yeah, so growing up in growing up in Canada, so you're from Ontario. Mm -hmm. You're you're, um, you're very, you've, you've done a lot in, in that scene and mm -hmm. done a lot here now now in Nashville. And um, so what was that transition kind of like coming coming down to the States? And um, You know, I mean, it was kind of something that was always in the back of my mind, you know, it was kind of always sort of the angle was, was to end up here. Um, and I, and I thought about moving here actually sooner than I did, but then I ended up getting an offer for a record deal in Canada and it was a really good deal. I loved the team there. And so it kind of made sense to put in a couple years and, you know, build, build an audience and a career in Canada. And then, um, and I, at that point I didn't really have like a game plan yet. I just knew that I, that was going to be my focus for at least the next couple of years. And I mean, honestly, things, things happened and took off pretty fast for me, which, which was great. Cause I mean, it was fast in that sense, but I also had been waiting for that moment since, you know, the, the most of my, the rest of my life, you yeah. know, I'd been playing in bands. Um, it, I had several bands growing up, you know, starting from when I was like 13, um, and I, I studied music in, in college and had a couple different bands during those times. My last band before I went solo was a bluegrass band. And so that was like really my first taste of touring. We made a couple of records ourselves just independently. Um, and then, you know, when that kind of, when we went our separate ways, that was when I started doing the solo thing. So anyway, that after a couple of years, I got to a point where um, you know, if I wasn't touring, I was in Nashville writing anyway. And so I was like hardly home and there were just not a lot of reasons to be there anymore. And I also felt like the more time I spent in Nashville, you know, when I would come home, 
it just didn't really feel like it's where I needed to be anymore. Yeah. I felt, you know, I just, I felt really kind of uninspired and, and I wasn't as motivated when I was at home because I was, I wasn't around other musicians and other people doing what I was doing. So it was like easy to fall back into like, you know, what my friends back home were doing. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I just, I wasn't focused the way I wanted to be. So I was actually on tour. My, my first big tour that I did was um, with Tom Cochran. In nice. Canada. Yeah. Kind of a random tour, but yeah. it was, you know, I took it because, I mean, one, I just wanted to play regardless, but I also feel like it was, it was a really good exercise for me as an entertainer because, um, you know, I, it wasn't really my demographic or my genre, you know, and so I had to walk out on stage every night and, and, and learn how to like read the crowd and how to win them over, um, which, you know, was not really my, my normal yeah, audience. Absolutely. So I was out on that tour and, you know, I was, had been in a relationship and we had just broken up and I was like trying to figure out like, where am I going to live when I get yeah. back from this, this tour? And then I was like, wait a minute, like, why am I even staying in Canada? Like, there's nothing left there for me anymore. And so I came back, and within probably 36 hours, I had packed up my truck in the U-Haul and drove down to Nashville. Hell yeah. So, yeah, it was, it happened quick when I made the decision. Yeah, and you found, like, a group of friends. Like, mm -hmm. the, like I know Farron and your, yourself and Lainey and, and mm -hmm. Ashlyn and, and Jenna and Casey, it's, they coined the term the bad bitches they, of yeah, Nashville. Yeah, they are. Y'all, y'all, y'all do, like, the last, because I've been here, it'll be three years um, at the end of this month, mm -hmm. and it's like, and so from like 2018 on, even before that, y'all were making a lot of noise here in town, but around that time, like, I remember going to, going to Whiskey Jam and just kind of seeing mm -hmm. everybody blowing up at that yeah. point, so that had to be cool to come into town. Like, when did you first get in touch? When did you become friends with all those so, powerful ladies? <laughs> so this is this is the crazy thing, and it was like it really felt like like a god thing when I when I moved here. Like, obviously, you know, I I felt good about the move, but it was still scary. Like, it was a huge change, yeah. you know, and and I didn't really know a lot of people here, um, other than like some people that I'd written with, um, and so. Literally the first night, like I had driven from Canada that morning with Oliver, my guitar player, you know, 14 hour drive. We get in and I was like, dude, I'm like, let's just leave all this stuff. Let's go get a beer somewhere. Been a long day. And so I don't remember how we ended up at, I think it was Basement East. And so we're waiting outside to go in and I hear this voice behind me. So, so Casey and I had started following each other on social media before I ever moved. We'd never met. We didn't know each other. It was just kind of like, you seem cool. Like, I'm going to follow you. I yeah. like your music. We were both into hunting and, you know, all that stuff. So I'm standing there and I hear, Megan Patrick? And I'm like, Who's, who knows me here? Like, she's like, hey, it's me, Casey Tindall. <laughs> and, and she like runs up and she's like, what are you doing here? I thought she lived in Canada. And I was like, well, I actually like literally just moved here today. And she was like, oh, my gosh. She's like, well, you you need to meet my roommate, Lainey, and you need to come out to the house. Like, there's no real country-ass girls in this town. I'm like, you're like a real country-ass bitch. Like, you out there hunting yeah. and shit. Like, she's going off. And I was just like, okay, like, great. Yeah, like, I would love that. And it's like, with girls, like, girls don't really do that. You know, they don't really, like, just – come up and like be nice to you yeah. <laughs> sometimes and like be like hey let's be friends like unless sometimes there's like some kind of ulterior motive or you know whatever especially within the industry because sometimes it can feel very kind of competitive you know yeah and and part of that and this is going off on a tangent a little bit but hey, I mean, you're do, good you you say whatever you want <laughs> i mean i'll do that you can you can rein me in i get a little chatty but like you know part of that that whole atmosphere comes from the fact that you know the, the way the industry has been for women in country, and it's definitely getting better now. Yeah. But there was a period of time where we were all talking about it, you know, the lack of women. on Tomato country. gate, baby. Yeah, yeah. tomato gate. It was a right. real thing. It was a real thing. And so, you know, I think it really did breed this energy amongst women in the industry that, like, we had to be competitive with each other because there was only room for one of us. And, like, there kind of was <laughs> at the time, you know. And so I was just so grateful to meet these girls like immediately when I when I moved there and like I said it, it was a God thing it was like God was like telling me this is where you're supposed to be these are the people you're supposed to meet and you know they've become they're they're not even I don't even call them friends I mean they're my family and they're my biggest inspirations and they're so talented they work so hard you know we all kind of have our own thing that we do and we genuinely support each other and 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 lift each other up we're not competitive we don't get jealous and weird about things you know like we, because we all believe that when one of us succeeds we all do and it just Absolutely. you know it just opens more doors for all of us 
And, you know, I talked to Mitchell about this and, and, you know, he, he kind of compares us to like his sort of guy group. You know, he came up with Devin Dawson and, and Hardy and Jordan Schmidt and like all these guys that all write and have now become really successful artists and writers and producers and stuff. And he's like, when I see, I look at y'all and I think of you as being, being that, you know? And so that's, I mean, that's a compliment to me. So I'm like, shit, if we can do half of what, <laughs> what y'all have done, then yeah. we'll be killing it. So. Yeah, because there really is. I mean, and you're you're starting to see it with with radio stuff. You're starting to see it with tour slots, and it's like you guys aren't just singing like stereotypical songs. Like y'all write the real shit. Mm-hmm. Y'all are all so uniquely yourselves. Yeah. And like when you go and watch a, a Meg Patrick show, you're gonna you're gonna come out there with that harmonica. You're gonna rock <laughs> that freaking crap. Same thing with Laney. Same thing. Same yeah. fact, no, that's the thing. And Casey too, and Ashlyn. Mm-hmm. The, the whole crew is so entertaining, and yeah. it's it's refreshing, and it's been cool to watch that over mm-hmm. the last few years, especially because I yeah. feel like. For some reason, the last few years, it's really, like, picked up. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. General. I mean, well, and now, you know, with Lainey getting her first number one, yeah. you know, like, that was, like, that was, like, a such a win, like, to all of us. Like, we've all been, like, cheering for her. And, you know, I can't tell you how many stories I've posted of her playing that song on rounds being, like, if this doesn't go number one, like, y'all are all wrong. Like, y'all are crazy, you know? And we all felt that way. And so, you know, it's just like it's seeing like for Mitchell, like for them, it was Devin was that yep. first one to get that that number one of that that group or well, I guess it went to two, but whatever. It's, <laughs> it's a number one. It's yes. a smash, whatever yes. it is, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not not one of those like all of those girls are so much more than just a pretty face. They're all fantastic writers. They're great entertainers. They're, they're good human beings. They their work ethic is unmatched. I mean, those girls work their asses off. We all do. And so. It, they're easy to root for and know? incredible hangs and so incredible my, hangs that's yeah. the other thing too is like Ugh. just going after after yeah. a whiskey jam over to losers or red door yeah some of the some of the best times you could have in nashville is with you and, and your friends yeah i don't i don't know what i do without them truly i mean this this is such a hard industry and it kicks your ass so hard sometimes and you know there's there's always peaks and valleys and sometimes you know it, there's going to be lots of times in our group where some of us are on a high and some of us are on a low. Some of us are going through some shit. You know, we lose a deal or we're changing management or whatever it is, or a single, you know, doesn't ha- doesn't work or whatever. Like, and we all just are there for each other for the highs and the lows. And you know, that's just so. I've never really had that actually, to be honest with with like other girls. You know, I grew up, I was always kind of a tomboy and I was, I played a lot of sports and like was into outdoor stuff, hunting and fishing and all that. And so I naturally just ended up hanging around more guys. And don't get me wrong, I had girlfriends that are awesome people, but like they're not in music. So there's, yeah. there's a whole aspect of my life that like they don't, they couldn't possibly understand because nobody can understand it unless you're in it. You yeah, know? absolutely. And that's something I even see going back to New York. Granted, I'm on kind of this side where I'm. I'm doing the personality thing where I go out touring with a crew, but it's like there's such a such a connection. Like you build such a bond with people mm-hmm. around music and around this lifestyle yeah. because it is a hectic lifestyle. Yeah. I, mean, I remember we were in uh, we were in North Carolina together recently. Mm-hmm. You had flown in from Florida, and yeah. then it's like, how many jobs do you do that where you do you go down to Florida, you play a festival, then you then you fly up and you're at some random ass Harley Davidson, <laughs> yeah. and the next day and you're you're getting a tattoo before the show and like all that <laughs> like. Like, it's like, what other job do you get to do that? It's like the yeah. coolest job in the world, but so many people don't get it, you know? Yeah. They don't quite understand, yeah. especially when you're starting out, which, yeah. what was what was starting out like? Like, were you, was in Canada, they have like a four-hour cover circuit thing like they have <laughs> down here? Like, what's what's starting out on the Canadian circuit like? Um, so, I mean, when I got started, you know, obviously the first thing was going in and writing and getting the songs together to, to put out a record, um... My first single I actually wrote with Chad Kroger. <laughs> no Nickelback. shit. Yeah. Me and him, uh, my manager at the time, had a relationship with him and started talking to him. She's like, I'm working with this new girl. Like, she, you know, I think she's she's really great. Like, would you, would you, like, write with her? And so I went out to L.A. and we sat down and we wrote my first single. And then, well, at the time it was just a song and he did the demo for it. Excuse me. Hey, you're good. Sorry, girl. I'm drinking beer. Um <laughs> And, uh, and the demo just sounded really great. And, you know, after that, uh, he was like, well, you know, I was like, would you want to produce it? And so he did. And then at that time it was just a single, but he said, you know, send, send me stuff, like send me what you're working on. Like, I want to, want to hear what you're doing. And, um, I send, I sent him a song that was a duet that I'd written. Um, 
and he flipped over the song. He's like, oh my gosh, I love this. He's like, let me like let me produce some more sides on your record. I was like, I mean, it's not let you. I'm like, I don't know if we can afford you, but like, yeah, obviously that would be amazing. And then he had asked me, he's like, so, you know, who would you want to sing this duet with you? And I was like, well, like realistically as a new unknown artist or like if I could have anyone. And he said, if you could have anyone. And I was like, honestly, I, I feel like Joe Nichols would be perfect for it. I, he, it was a very kind of traditional country kind of thing. And I just like could picture his voice on it. He goes, oh, I know Joe. Yeah, I'll ask him. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, cool. Like there's no way he's going to do it, you know? And then a couple weeks later, he texts me. He's like, Joe's in. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, he loved the song. He's in. And uh, so we, we cut that and a few other songs. And um, yeah, I mean, that the, the duet was my first top 10 song in Canada. So, no shit. Yeah. And so, you know, we did same kind of thing, radio tour, although it is uh, not quite as intense as here because there's just not as many stations. Yeah. It's just a, a smaller market. Um, but we did that. And then. Yeah, the first like I guess the first fest the first shows or first tour I did some dates with Kit Moore, which was awesome, um, and then the Tom Cochran thing, and then getting on all the festival circuit that the, kind of that stuff. That festival so. circuit can be exhausting. Yeah, it's, it's a like, lot. Yeah, and the thing about festivals in Canada too is like you kind of you really gotta like make hay while the sun shines because there's a much smaller window of opportunity to like play outside in Canada because yeah. it gets so cold. Um, you know, so it's like that that summer is just like nuts because you're you're trying to play as many of them as you can because yeah. that's where the best money is made too for an artist and also like a lot of it is like on opposite sides of the country yep. like you know and you're going I can't tell you how many times I've played you know Cavendish out in PEI which is like almost as far east as you can go and then flying com to you know Calgary to play the Stampede the next day, Jeez. which is on the complete opposite side of the country. So you're not getting a lot of sleep, that's for sure. Yeah, see, I remember actually, um, it was, and for me, it, it's like a signature, like badass Meg Patrick moment. It was, I believe, was it at a festival? I believe in Canada, there was a, there was some asshole in the oh. front, <laughs> and I remember watching that clip and being like, "You go, Meg!" Like yeah. that's 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 quintessential, like. <laughs> Yeah, that was crazy. That w that was a festival in Canada, and it was like, so there were a couple things that happened too before that festival that I think made it that I like kind of snapped <laughs> the way. But I no, did. good for you for snapping because yeah. that's not right for somebody to be saying no. shit like that. Well, and here and here's the thing is like, that's not the first time. I mean, shit, it's not even the tenth time some idiot said something like that to me. And most of the time, I would like you know I would crack a joke or you know talk a little shit, whatever, move on. Yeah. But, you know, for some, there was a couple things that had already happened. You know, we, we ended up, we already had a late slot for a headliner, which is like, can be tough with festivals when people have been drinking in the sun since two o'clock and you're not even going on stage till like 10 or 1030 yeah. or whatever. And, and then there was a huge delay and like, we ended up going on stage. We were already like 30 minutes later than we should have been. And so I was, I was kind of frustrated because I knew that we had lost some of the audience because people were just tired and like drunk. Yeah, it <laughs> you, happens, yeah. You know, and it was the last night. And so anyway, I was frustrated with that. We finally get on stage. We're getting in the groove. And then, you know, I'm starting to introduce a song and this guy yells it out. He says, show me your tits. And first time I was like, I didn't say anything. Just ignored it. Kept going. And then he said it again, even louder. And I was like, oh, OK, you want my attention, motherfucker? You just got yeah. it. And how many times can I say fuck on this podcast? Well, however because, many times you want. We're sponsored by a weed company. You're okay. Good. <laughs> all right. Well, because there's because I think I think I might have broken a record for most times saying fuck inside of like a, you know, one yeah. 30 minute, 30 second speech. I just like I don't know what it was. It I just like saw red because he was like it wasn't just that he said it. He was like being disruptive. Like he was like kept doing it. You know, he did it more than once. So I was like, all right. Turn. I'm like, no, no, no put the lights on the crowd. Who said that? It's like crickets, you know, and I was like, no, 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 you said it like own up to it kind of thing. And literally everybody in the crowd just like points at this guy, like totally throws him under the bus. And I looked at him, I was like, you, I was like, get the fuck out. And he starts yelling back at me. I said, no, no, no. I said, get the fuck out. I'm like, like, this is not, this is not a strip club. You know, I'm like, I did not work my whole life, you know, to get up here and, you know, put my blood, sweat and tears into, into this performance and these songs to have it like degraded to 
show me your tits. You yeah. know, I, I just, and I just, I said, I don't even remember what I said, but I just said, I work too damn hard, motherfuckers. So fuck you. Yeah. And that, Amen. <laughs> and Amen, was, girl. And that was the, and the crowd just like went wild. Thankfully, yeah. like they were, they were definitely on my side. You know, they well, had my who back. Wouldn't, and, well, who wouldn't be on your side? And oh, I think, and I think so trust many, me. and I, well, I think, I think so many, so many like females will see that too, because a lot of folks deal with that. Yes. Like it's not just happening, happening to you. Well, it was interesting because, so after this happened, like, you know, after after that happened, we just we finished the set and I when I came off stage, I actually was like kind of upset. Like it was just it was such a shitty feeling to be yeah. up there and like trying to kill it. And then some guy just thinks that's all you're worth. You know what I mean? And so the next day I'm in Nashville and I wake up and my buddy Sam Sumzer, he he's calling me. It's like nine in the morning and I'm like, shit, like, am I supposed to be at a right right now? He's like, dude, you're a badass. I was like thanks <laughs> like, oh so you had no idea that it was like this, i had this no moment. idea yeah that that this like he's like no he's like your video i'm like my music video like what are you talking about he's like that video of you like cussing that guy out he's like it's like gone viral it was like on reddit and blah 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 i was like what and then i start thinking like oh shit like am i gonna be in trouble like is the label gonna be pissed like because i had just started talking with riser house and was you know gonna do a deal with them and i'm like oh my god like what if you know they get really upset and I remember Jen, Jennifer Johnson, who's ahead at, at Riser, she called me. Excuse me, sorry, I keep burping. Um, You're good. And she called me, and I was, like, so nervous. I'm like, is she going to be upset? And she was like, I'm so proud of you. Yeah. She said, you know, that is that is – one of the reasons why I wanted to sign you. That's the Megan that I love. Like, and I was like, okay, so you're not mad. She said, absolutely not. She's like, I'm, we're blowing this up. I'm calling USA today. <laughs> like I'm doing this. So all yeah. of a sudden I'm like doing all these like interviews and everything around this. And, and I started re and I made a post about it on my social media, kind of explaining things. And I basically what I said was like, I'm not sorry for what I said. Could I have said fuck less? Yeah, probably. But you know, I didn't have time. I wasn't afforded the luxury of like time to like, create this well thought out speech I just I honestly said exactly what I was thinking as I was thinking it and said it with the the amount of anger and passion that I was feeling about it and you know it within the industry I was it, there was an overwhelming amount of like positive support and I got a lot of really awesome messages from like other female artists being like you know I've had that happen to me and I've never said anything and it always bothered me and like you just literally gave me the courage to say something the next time because, you know, I was worried that people like I would get backlash for it and whatever. And so, you know, for a while it was like really positive and then it got really dark. Um, really? Yeah. I had um, one of my friends, her mom was like at work and this woman at her work was like, hey, have you seen this video? Like, isn't your daughter like friends with her or whatever? So somebody that was at the festival had posted it on on Facebook and, and like in support of me, this was someone that was a fan of mine and she started going through the comments and sent it to me and I like, I'm pretty tough. I got a pretty thick skin, but it was absolutely horrible. The things people were saying just like, oh my God, like I don't even want to say it. Yeah. It's like, it was just really, really nasty and just like. You know, because I expected, you know, some people were mad about the language, like, oh, there, there might have been children there. And I was like, OK, well, if you bring a child to a music festival at, and they're still there at like midnight, like they're going to see and hear adult things. Also, like, I'm not the fucking Wiggles. OK, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not a child entertainer. I'm a grown ass woman who, does, who makes music for grown ass people. And like, yeah. And also, if you think that a woman using the word fuck to stand up for herself is the most damaging thing your child saw on the Internet today, you... <laughs> You are delusional. You've got no idea. Like you think like if you if you have a kid that's on social media, I mean, first of all, they're I guess they're supposed to be what, fourteen or older? At least and you think they haven't heard that word before. Yeah. Like like get over yourself. Also, it's not my I'm not, it's not my job to raise your kids. Like that's Absolutely. your job. Absolutely. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. But yeah, it was that was the tough part. And and I had to remind myself that like, you know, for lack of a better term, these are people from uh shallow end of the gene pool like these are yeah. these are people that like are just get on the internet they're keyboard warriors trolls. you know the they're trolls. trolls yep they're miserable people like and i sh you shouldn't care you know what they think but that was like kind of my one of my first tastes of like really being like bullied and attacked online and it was it was tough <laughs> yeah. I, had, I had to like give myself some boundaries on like going online and like just not looking at it for a yeah. while because it really bothered me.
Yeah, well, I think I speak for everybody in in, in Nashville in our in our music world when I say like that was the uh, end of the day, end of discussion, um, badass moment for real. Thank you. Like I remember watching that, being like, "You go, Meg." So last year, to, last year, so that happens twenty nineteen. So twenty twenty, hmm. we find out about this thing called COVID. Mm. World shuts down. You yeah. you have dual citizen. Are you you have dual citizenship? Yes. Yeah. So you have dual citizenship, and borders are closing, gigs are ending. What what got you through last year? Because last year, I'm trying. Weed and whiskey. Weed and whiskey. (laughs) Hey, there. No, I mean. I'm with you on half of that. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, honestly, it was was really, really, really tough because I was like, I was kind of at this place where, you know, I was kind of really having, I was like peaking in Canada. I was on my first headlining tour in Canada. had just been on a sold out like Old Dominion arena tour with Mitchell. Um I had just signed my U.S. record deal and like we were trying, we were getting ready to like go to radio with my first U.S. single. I had all these big festivals lined up. Like I was literally like in this position where, you know, all signs are pointing to like this, your shit is about to blow up. Like this is going to be your year. And, um, and then it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> and so as soon as I knew that this like realized like, okay, we're losing shows, like this is and the light at the end of the tunnel is getting further and further away and just kept getting worse and worse and worse and so I was like all right I've got to make the best of this time and just write a bunch of songs I just I'm gonna focus on my songwriting I'm gonna I'm gonna work at it in a way that I have never done before because to be honest like before that I mean I writing for me was like I'd be on the road most of the time I'd come home for like three days go in and write maybe two or three of those days and then right back out on the road so I never had a lot of time to really like work at songwriting and so and then the worst part of it was like after I told myself that this was my plan it was like I had just like the worst writer's block like just I was so like I swear like I couldn't have written a song to save my life I couldn't I had no ideas I had no inspiration I was just like probably partly because I was just really depressed and upset about everything that was going on So I told myself, like, all right, stop beating yourself up over it. Just this is what you're going to do every day for at least one hour. You're going to sit down with your guitar and you're going to you're going to work on something like you don't have to write a whole song. Like even if you just sit there and come up with a cool riff or a melody or a little bit of lyrics or whatever it is for at least one hour. Like if after an hour you got nothing cool, you stop. You, You tried. If it turns into something else, great. And being more intentional about my creative process really change something yeah. for me and I and and then after that I felt like I started writing some of the best songs I'd ever written because I was really like I was making it a job I wasn't just like showing up to the right and like using whatever I guess natural ability I have to write a song I was working at it and yeah. I was you know making time to work at it outside of the writing room so that was kind of what got me through was just trying to immerse myself in the creative part of things I was I wanted to spend more time you know playing my guitar getting better at guitar and I learned how to use pro tools so I could hey, you know, start there you you know, go. doing that kind of thing and so yeah I, I think there was a lot of positive things that that came out of it but there's still a part of me that feels very bitter about what I feel like was taken away and the way it's still affecting my career now you know well how's 2021 been going you know it's there's been some some good and some bad I mean it's You know, I lost like basically all even though we got shows back here in the U.S., like I only had so many shows for the U.S. And like I had a lot of stuff that was supposed to be happening in Canada. Oh, yeah. And like nothing. They everything just kept getting canceled. And so it sucked because like there were some U.S. things that I had turned down to play in Canada because one, I, I needed to, you know, keep up with my audience there. But also like that was my you know, that was my moneymaker. You know, I'm not really where I'm at in the U.S., level right now it's like I'm I'm just kind of barely breaking even whereas like in Canada I make good money yeah and so I had this whole plan to essentially use the money I was making in Canada to help support and supplement my touring in the U.S. yeah people don't realize that when you what like there's so much that goes into touring mm-hmm. and goes into promotion and goes yeah. into all that stuff there's so many expenses yeah. the it breaking takes a while e- to actually make money yeah like it, to actually profit it does it does now for for Canada, where's where would you say? And I don't mean to put you on the spot, but where's like the best Canadian market? Like where where do you know you're gonna go? And it's gonna be a crowd that's gonna gonna it's do tough. the research, sing back the words. They're gonna be rowdy. They're gonna buy the merch. Like I mean, you know, obviously, I'm from Ontario, so like I my biggest fan base is still there because 
I've toured there the most. Like Boots and Hearts is a big festival there. That's that's kind of always been like my favorite because it's kind of like a hometown festival for me. And I yeah. know I'm going to get like my hometown crowd and, you know, the people that have kind of been there from the beginning. But, you know, also, I mean, there's a lot of great. I mean, Calgary, like the Stampede is always crazy. Um, but then, you know, there's a lot of markets that are in kind of all the in between middle of nowhere, like prairie provinces where, you know, it, it's not the biggest markets and always the biggest crowds. But the the quality of the crowd is so good because they don't get as many shows, you know, so as when, some they, of when the, they come out, they're going to show out. Yeah, it means a lot to them exactly. that you're coming to their their yeah. little farm town. Yeah, they, they don't get as many shows as some of the other bigger markets get. And so, yeah, like when they do get a show like they're that's like the thing and they're coming to party like they're having a good time. So in some ways, those crowds can sometimes be even more fun than some of the bigger crowds because they're really like into it. Hell yeah! Now you mentioned Chad Krug earlier, and I've got I got my Jordan Rager shirt on. Mutual mm-hmm. good mutual friend of ours, okay. and he's 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 on my side with this. So is so is our buddy Ben Miller, and I believe McElwain is too. Why do people hate Nickelback? Why do you think that is? Because I love Nickelback, dude. I, first, like, of I don't all, get it. First of all, I just I don't know how this like became a thing because I just don't believe that that many. I like I just like honestly y'all are lying because the sales would suggest otherwise. Yeah, there's no way as ma- like as many people that say they hate Nickelback. There's no way that that it's even true, and I, I don't even know why. I mean, honestly, I just think when you start doing something right, you, that's when you get haters. You know, if yeah. if you don't have haters, you're doing something wrong. You're you're not like I've always said. I would rather be a polarizing artist where like either you love me or you hate me, but at least either way you feel really strongly about me. You give I, enough of a fuck yeah, to feel one way. Exactly. To feel some way as opposed to just like feeling nothing and being like who, you know, whatever. So I don't know. I, th- I think also just because there was probably like a lot of people that listened to more because they got so popular. It's like in some genres, I feel like being becoming popular is like, you know a bad thing it's like oh there's sellouts yeah there's sellout you know exactly what I mean? yeah. yeah and like i think in that genre that's like that's a thing yeah and it's funny too i mean when you when you look at it like cuz who their producer was is now a very top producer in country mm-hmm. music so yep. it's like people shit on nickelback but they're still jamming a lot of the artists that are now being produced by mm-hmm. Joey Moy the same or jamming the songs guy. that Chad has written yeah. I mean Chad's a great songwriter and he's written country songs like, too yeah so I, like, I know he wrote with you who else who else was he was he um i'm trying with? to remember he had a tim mcgraw cut um, a oh, no while shit. ago, I did not know that. <laughs> That's Don't awesome. quote me on that, but I'm almost positive. But somebody in that realm, like yeah. But I mean, he he loves country music. Like to be honest, like when I before I went to go write with him, and when when it was brought up to me, it was I was I'm like really, I'm like the Nickelback guy, like, and she was like, no, 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 like he's he he's a country boy, like he loves country music. He's a great writer, and I was like, okay, well, yeah, sure. I mean, why not? Like, we'll we'll go do it. And like being in in the room and writing with him. He really is a fantastic songwriter and he's really passionate about it. He's really passionate about country music. And then, you know, beyond that, going into the studio with him when when we were like picking songs and going over songs, doing that process with him was really enlightening because I realized how he became as successful as he was because, you know, we would sit and we would listen through songs and then once we would pick once we picked the songs we went through all of those songs with like a fine tooth comb and he would be he would literally be like okay do, do you think that the melody the lyrics you know all of that is completely on point or are there are there any weak spots are there any parts that you feel eh about because if you do we're going to fix them right now you know and he was like he was really hard on me about that and i'd be like well like there was one thing i'd be like well no it's like this is what I mean when I when I say this lyric like it's supposed to be, it's like da 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 da. He said, "Let me ask you this." He said, "When this song's when this song comes on the radio, are you going to be sitting in the passenger seat next to the listener able to explain to them, you know, what you meant by that lyric?" He said, "No." He's like, "So you got to find a way to make it clear, you know." And so I I learned a lot from him in that that process of like how to be, you know, that's that's how you go from the difference between a great song and a hit song. Yeah. For sure, uh, and he's a great guy to learn from. Obviously, I mean mm-hmm. the yeah, he's done all right. Yeah, he's done done pretty good for himself. <laughs> He's talking about um, passionate something else, something that you're passionate about, and they're they're looking really good now. And I'm sure there's been years where where you the the Buffalo Bills. When I yes. think of Buffalo Bills, and for me being a New Yorker, they are the one true team that plays in New York, mm-hmm. even though they do play some games over the border in your mm-hmm. neck of the woods. 
Um, how, where, where did your passion for Buffalo Bills football really come from? Because I see every, every Sunday in the football <laughs> season, like you're, you're yeah. decked out, you're Jersey, repping. Yeah, I'm going. Um, my mom is from Buffalo. Okay. So yeah, I, you know, I spent a lot of time in Buffalo growing up with her family and it was just, I mean, I was kind of, I was kind of born into it. I didn't really have a choice in that house. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are the, do you think they could win it this year? I mean, I think. I, don't, I, I think that we can definitely get to the Super Bowl. I do. I think, like, just the trajectory of this team over the past three years has been so steady, like, just getting better and better and better and, and really fast. Um, and I think we've added some some new pieces to the team that, that are really going to, like, round it out. I mean, I think Sanders is going to be a huge, like, see, yeah. just watching him play the last couple weeks – you know, because some of our other, you know, offense, they're they're really great, but they're still young. They don't have that same experience. So I think having someone like him that is still very athletic, you know, very dynamic, but has experience um, is going to be yeah. a big asset. Because I think that's that is one of our or has been, you know, one of our downfalls at times is is inexperience. Like and the same with Allen. I mean, he's he's obviously very talented. He's very athletic. I think he's smart. But I think he still – he lets emotions yeah, get still, the better of him sometimes. Yeah, he's still you know? young. He's still I mean, young, yeah. you know. And so – but I have but I feel like I've watched him learn from those mistakes and, yeah. and really adjust and, and correct them. And so, I mean, obviously, we've been playing very well yeah. the, la the last couple of weeks. But granted, I, I don't think we've really faced a, a, a really, really aggressive team yet. So we've got Kansas City. Got yeah, the Chiefs next that's, week. That's so, a big one. So I'm kind of like I'm kind of reserving my my thoughts on this until I see how they play against the Chiefs. Because like I'm sitting here, I'm like I just I hope that they don't. You know, they need to go into this game like they haven't been whooping ass for the last two weeks. Like they need to go in hungry and not like assume anything. Yeah, and it's got to be nice going up to New England and not seeing Tom Brady. Oh up man, there, <laughs> you know it's the cra the crazy thing is like. I don't hate him as much anymore. I don't either. And I kind of like him now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of. I have not... hated Tom Brady like my whole life, and now I'm like, yeah, I like Tom Brady. <laughs> yeah, seeing him, seeing him and Gronk, and it's amazing. You take yeah. him out of Fox, take him out of New England, out of yeah. Foxborough, and and yep. and because uh, I I don't mind rooting rooting for Tom Brady now either. Mm -hmm. And I'm from New York. Anything yeah. Massachusetts, anything Boston, yeah. New England, I'm gonna I'm gonna be well, against. It was like almost like he got put into like an underdog position all of a sudden. Yeah, you know, and he and he. Like he did, he showed us all why he's the goat. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why? Why he's the best? You a big hockey girl? Honestly, no. No. I mean, I I like hockey, but I never followed hockey the way I did football. I mean, I know that sounds crazy. I guess I'm like a bad Canadian for that. <laughs> but I think part of it was that, um, like the Leafs just sucked for such a long yeah. time, and they, like that would have been like kind of my home team, and I was like. Okay, I'm already a Bills fan and a Jays fan, and I'm like, I'm not taking on a third shitty team. Yeah. So <laughs> I kind of like was like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna claim any hockey teams. Like I would always watch it, and I, I love the sport itself. But um, like also to go see the Leafs, like it was so freaking expensive. Yeah, they are the top ticket in it's Toronto. Insane. Yeah. And I'm like, to you're gonna pay that much to go watch them suck? Like to watch them lose? Like yeah. I could go and see our OHL team, like the Oshawa Generals, for thirty bucks and get a beer for half the price you could get in Toronto and like they play better hockey than the Leafs, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. but then, you know, when I moved to Nashville, Mitchell is a huge Preds fan. And so I decided it made sense for me to be a Preds fan. So, yeah. And, and you were, you've been in town long enough. Do you remember the, the chaos that yes. was CMA fest, yes. Preds Stanley cup, Bonnaroo mm -hmm. all going on at the same time. I've been coming in town long enough to remember when they were like nothing, when they like weren't good and you would go to a game and like, it was only half full. <laughs> yeah, and now it's like now it's now they're pretty hard tickets to get, and it's yeah. like and you have the visiting teams that come in. Cause mm -hmm. I used to work on Broadway. I was a door guy at Whiskey Row, mm -hmm. so I'd work weekends, and you'd always deal with the visiting fans that would come in for the Preds mm -hmm. and for the Titans. And I got to say, the Bills fans were my favorite. Oh yeah, like we had Eagles fans, we had Patriots fans, we had Raider fans, we had. Colts well, fans and they were weeks, horrible. So about Bills are about to come take over Nashville. Yes, and I'm really I'm looking forward to it because the Bills fans they were always super nice. All they would do is climb up a tree and jump through a table. They they tip you on the way out. No yeah. fights, no bullshit, no yeah. no shit talking. They were super cool, easy yeah. going, just fun people. I like to get drunk and jump through tables. It's it's a, yeah no, it's a good vibe. I mean, I'll I'll never forget the first time I got to see a game at the Ralph and like go to the tailgate and everything and like it's. 
I mean, at the time, the football was terrible, but the tailgate was great. Yeah, so <laughs> I thought you were going to say the first time you jumped through a table, and I was like, oh, you man. You know, I have to be honest, I never have. You haven't done that yet? Mm-mm. I actually said last year that if if the Bills went to the Super Bowl, I would I would jump through a table. And so I'll I'll keep that that word. That would be incredible content right yeah, there. Yeah, if, if, if the Bills go to the Super Bowl, I will jump through There's a table. There's your viral TikTok moment, which what do you think of that, by the way? Because you're somebody who's been around for a long time. What's what's that? What's what's that been like on oh, social yeah. media wise? I don't know if we have enough time to talk about how I feel about TikTok. Um, <laughs> you're you know, good. okay, so. Because I've heard so many like mixed things. And yeah. obviously, I mean, I've. What, what me and Matt get to do every weekend is in a way kind of a result, but I don't think of like our bar, our Mr. Trey Lewis as a TikTok guy because mm-hmm. he's been doing music. Like the TikTok, the, the TikTok music artist is somebody that I think of that's never played a show that does the mm-hmm. the the lip syncing of the lyrics, like does all yeah. that stuff, yeah, yeah, which yeah. to me kind of drives me a little nuts. Yes. Well, here's, here's my thing. Like, so my biggest focus and, and and I would say one of my biggest strengths as an artist is my live show yeah you know I, I I pride myself in not just getting up there and singing but being an entertainer yeah. like which you, know, you, and, you do a great job of, by you. the way well and I because I've been doing it for a long time and it's always and it's also the thing I love the most I mean some of it you know it's equal parts like just passion and like loving what I do and just hard work and like really like I don't just get up and sing. I put we put thought into putting on a show, and because that was one thing that I I would notice is like especially for females, and this is no slight on any female or anything, but like I would see like some female artists, it's like they looked pretty and they sang great, but they just kind of stood up there and sang, and I was like, well yeah, it's great that you could sing and that you're pretty, but like this is a boring show, and I was like, and I told myself like I don't ever want to be that girl. I need to like be dynamic, be an entertainer, you know. And like going out like with Kip, like on that first tour, oh, Kip yeah. Kip is that guy. Yes, he you know is. he is he's an entertainer, and and so many of my my favorite artists are you know and and also like I've even outside of country like I'm very influenced by a lot of rock you know rock bands and and rock musicians that are just like wild you know so um the thing sorry going back to TikTok <laughs> you're, you're good girl you're good um when TikTok came on like to for me personally, I hate social media. Like, I hate that it's a necessary part of my career. Like, if I was not an artist, I, I probably wouldn't even have it. Like, just because for a number of reasons. Like, one, I hate the idea of just being glued to my phone and, like, obsessing over likes and views and shit like that all the time. And two, also because I feel like a lot of what you see on there is just so, like, disingenuous and, like, just not authentic and it's like it's a, that just it's a fake highlight reel yeah it just like feels gross to me you know and and like so when the tiktok thing happened i was like it was in a time where all we had as artists to stay connected with the fans and keep moving our careers forward was social media which was tough for me because i hated it to begin with you yeah. know and and then it's like all of a sudden tiktok becomes this thing like People are getting like massive record deals over, you know, this one viral video and like and then all of a sudden labels, it's like that's all they care about. It's like if it ain't popping on TikTok, it ain't popping, you know, and I've I, I've, you know, had those conversations with a lot of artists in town who feel the same way that like all of a sudden it's like labels, you know, it comes to singles or picking songs. It's like, well, if it doesn't blow up on TikTok, then it's useless. You know, and, and that's just yeah. that's just crazy. I mean, I think it's a valuable tool and I think that you know, there it, it it is creating opportunities for for some really actually talented real artists to to get their break. But I also think there's a lot of things coming off of it that just shouldn't be, you know. And it, and I also don't think that like just because something blows up on TikTok, I don't think that necessarily correlates to an actual career. I don't think it necessarily correlates to people buying tickets and coming to your shows yeah. or even buying your records yep. or even streaming your songs. Cause like getting a like or a view on TikTok, all that that's like, all that means is that somebody kept your video on their screen for the whole time while they like took a shit or watched TV or laid in bed and they're just yeah. like scrolling. Like that doesn't necessarily mean that like, you have created a and, fan. And the demographic of TikTok is a much younger yes. demographic. Like half not... of these kids can't even come to my shows because they're not yeah. of age. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like we've yeah, like like for something that I've I've noticed out on the road is like the eighteen and over thing. A lot of clubs are starting to dip down to mm-hmm. that eighteen and over as yeah. opposed to twenty one because they 
they kind of kind of have to. But yeah, it's I mean, because it's different than what Vine was. Like mm-hmm. Vine was a thing, but I don't think it was as entrenched into society. Like I yeah. watch a Yankees game, and the Yankees are running TikTok ads. Like they're yeah. saying, brought to you by TikTok. Yeah. And it's like, what the fuck? Well, it's just TikTok, it regard- even outside of the music industry, TikTok just became such a big thing because it was during the pandemic and people literally had nothing better to do than to, like, sit on their phones all day. And, you know, and this is the other thing, too, is that, like, TikTok is not really, like, it's not for music. It's not a music app. It's, it's like, a entertainment app. You know, it's, like, it's like not... It's really a time. It's a time killer. It's it's yeah. a, instead of reading a book when you're sitting on the can, you're looking at TikTok. Yeah. That's what it's there for. Well, and it's also like a lot of it seems like, and this isn't everybody, you know, but like a lot of it seems like too. In order to to get something to blow up on TikTok, you got to have some like some thing that you're doing, you know, like some stupid like yeah, I don't know what's the word, like some kitschy like a gimmick something a like gimmick. that. Yeah. Thank you. That's the word I'm looking for. And I'm like, I'm not gonna do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like. I am 34 years old and I'm not trying to get up on TikTok in a little crop top and do some stupid dance, you know, <laughs> yeah. just to get people to listen to my yeah. music. You, you know? shouldn't have to do that because you got really good music and yeah. people should be going to well, YouTube or going right. to Spotify or going to right. places that are more meant for music. Well, like when did it, when, I just like it all of a sudden became like it wasn't good enough anymore in order to be an artist to just, you know, be able to write songs, play an instrument, sing and entertain like all of a sudden it's like no you got to be all that and you got to be a tiktok star or you don't matter and it's like i just am like again i'm like i don't think that a lot of my audience like in my demographic that are going to be lifelong fans are going to find me through tiktok you know or that that's not how i'm that's not how i win i win on a stage when i'm actually singing and actually performing because when you win somebody over at a live show like you probably won them over for life absolutely getting a like or a view on tiktok is means nothing even if it gets one song to blow up they're going to move on to the next thing that they find on tiktok after that unless you unless you can keep them with the rest of your catalog and they come out to a show and that's something that the the tl likes to say you have to have the other pieces in place yeah which is which is where you you do have some folks where where it does kind where it does happen and well and trey's one of them i mean i like when i saw when we played that show together You know, I I really had never seen him play a full set before. And I was like, I told him, I was like, dude, I I was impressed. Like, you you have a great show. Yeah. You you have other songs that are great. Like, you have, you are, you're a real artist. Like, you're, you're really going to do this. Yeah. And that's where it can be used to the advantage is if if you've got your shit kind of cooking. Yeah. If you've got your shit cooking, it's Mm -hmm. another avenue if radio is not fucking with you and big, big and like nobody's really, you don't have booking, anything like that. It can help. But if you're just really, if you're just a kid, like 18, 19, you're just putting out, you're just yeah. getting a song to blow up on there, but you've never done it before. That yeah. That's where it kind of rubs well, me. That's the, yeah. I mean, the thing, the, the bottom line for me is that like, it's great in that, you know, for situations like someone like Trey, it, it's, it's just another, you know, avenue, a platform that's going to help, that's going to give somebody a break that, that needs a break, yeah. you know, but it also, it's not even, you know even regardless of the the ones that I, you know, that are getting record deals and whatever else that I just don't think. And, should. and what's, and what's wild is they're probably those, that's another thing you got to watch out for. I know you've, you've, you're signed and you're with the riser house and stuff, mm-hmm. but you've always, people kind of see they're like, Oh, record deal. And deals are always a little bit different too. So mm-hmm. you have kids signing, signing yep. these deals and they have no idea what they're getting they're themselves not, into. Most and, of them are not good deals. Yeah. Their song will blow up and they own no right to the master. Mm-hmm. They, owe, they, they have to do this, this and this. Make and, bank off, off the master. And it won't matter if, if the artist ever does anything else beyond that because yeah. they they'll they'll make their money back and then some and unless the artist like manages to hold on to that audience and has like a killer single to follow which it up which is very tough gonna, to do it's very tough to do and and it's also for again for me and then we can get off of it but like it's it's also the idea that like I'm not mad at the people that have gotten success or record deals because of it like that's great for them what's frustrating to me is is that it has become this thing that has become so you know, all important to the industry that like if you're this idea that like if you're not blowing up on TikTok that you're not worth it or you're you're not viable or that like even if you have a, you know, even if you have a great voice, you write great songs and you're incredibly entertaining, which is what it's about. Right. It's like so what because I'm not blowing up on TikTok, I can't I, you don't want to give me a deal. Yeah. 
You know what I mean? It's like it's just, that's what's frustrating to me about it is it's become too important. It, it, they're putting yeah. too they're putting too much weight um, and importance on this thing that that might might you know pan out or might not. Like, yeah, and then and then the next app will come along, and yeah. then we just roll roll with it and stuff. So so right. what's been going on with you lately as far as music coming out? Like what's the plan now for the end of this year going into twenty twenty two? Which I'd say we're all excited for twenty twenty two because yes. half of this year's still been a clusterfuck yes. carrying over from twenty twenty. Yes. Um so, you know, we just put Heart on My Glass out um, yeah. back I guess end of June. Um so for right now, um, I'm I'm still I'm back writing again though. We're we're just looking to figure out what the the single is going to be for the U S. Um, you know, my stuff in Canada is still rolling. I've got cool about it is is going to radio in Canada is my Hell next yeah. single. Uh, we just shot a badass music video for it, which Dope. I'm super like the best video I've ever done. It's, what, what'd it's you get? Really cool. What'd you guys do? It you did here in Nashville. We did it here. Um, my my director Sean Hagwell. He's done like my last I think like five or six videos. He's just He's awesome. He's super creative. And um, because for me, like when I make music videos, I'm always trying to look to do something a little bit unexpected or or bring like a storyline, do something almost like a little more cinematic. Because like, you know, who needs another music video of just me glammed up doing a performance, you know, of the song. So this this video, um, I'll say this. It would be like if a James Bond movie and Ocean's Eleven had a baby to a country song. That's what this video sounds is. Sounds like a video I got to watch it's, when it comes out. I'm sick. excited. Yeah, Hell yeah. I'm really excited. So, yeah. So, other than that, I'm just trying to make plans for next year, keep writing, you know, figure out what that, that single is going to be, and then hopefully, you know, we'll be getting out to radio in the U.S. Um, beginning of next year. So. Hell yeah. That's awesome. Man, the wheels turn slow. Yeah. Hey, as Alan Jackson says. Yeah. No, it's it's part part of it for sure. Yeah. It's It's something that. It take it takes some time, but I gotta mm-hmm. say it's I'm I'm excited for you. Like Thank you. like the yeah. me, you got you got dope ass music. You're gonna go into these new markets. You're, they're gonna get the the Meg Patrick show. And mm-hmm. I, if you're not a fan, like I don't yeah. I don't <laughs> fuck with you if you don't fuck Meg Patrick. You know, like it. personally. So yeah. um, but yeah. So a couple of Nashville questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, favorite Mexican joint in town? Because we got a million of them, which I did oh, not expect man. coming from New York. I did not expect that. Nashville would have a shit ton of Mexican food. Are you not a big Mexican fan? No, I love Mexican. You know what? There is one that I went to that was in West Nashville, like near the Nations the other day that was really good. I can't remember what it was called, though. Um, But I... uh, Mas Taco is good in the East. I mean, honestly, they're all, like, pretty good. I, I don't even, like... Trying to think, like, what's a plate? Well, then, if not, if not, like, a specific Mexican joint, what's a joint that's, like, this is my favorite spot? Um, I mean, Mitchell and I go to Urban Grub a lot because nice. it's like by the house. Yeah. It's kind of like one of our favorite spots. Um, my friend um, RJ has a place called St. Stephen's in uh, Germ- Germantown. Yeah, which is awesome. Um, also, I mean, so I love steak. So any any steakhouse, any of like those steakhouses, King yeah. Prime is really good. Um, Luke Bryan's new place. What's that E3? called? E three. E three is yeah, really that place, good. That place. That place slaps for uh-huh. sure. Um, What's your red door? Your your. I'm drunk on a weeknight because I'm usually out on the road on the weekends. What's your drunk red night? Uh, red door order. Are you a potato salad girl? Are you a pizza girl? Oh, uh, usually, I know. Fa- I know. Farron likes them pizzas. Oh yeah, I usually I go for the. Sometimes I go for the pizza. Sometimes I go for like the turkey sandwich with the potato salad because that potato salad is. I don't know what they put in there, but it's another level. It's like, so good. But Red Door, I have this theory of Red Door too, because again, I don't drink, so it's like for me, it doesn't affect me too much. Mm-hmm. But they, the times, like it takes a minute to get yourself a drink and to get food at Red Door, and mm-hmm. I feel like part of the reason they do that is because then you just stick around longer, mm-hmm. and you get it's like a it's like you get trapped in a hole. Like yeah. you could be at Red Door for six, seven hours, and it oh, just yeah. kind of sucks you in. Yep, for sure. I mean, I like. I don't know. Midtown has changed so much since like since I moved here. And it's like I now I, I mostly only really want to go there like more like post right afternoon vibe. And then like after it gets dark, it's just like so sometimes you, you, it's you, you, too will, much. you will launch at Losers Girl. Oh, yeah, for sure. See, I've never done launch at Losers. Like I've never been there early enough. Great chicken tendies. Really? Mm-hmm. Better than Live Oaks? I don't know if I've ever had them at Live Oak. You haven't had Live Oak's chicken mm-hmm. tendies? Well, I feel like every time I go there, I'm usually playing around. I don't like to eat right before oh, I sing, so okay. I don't I usually you. eat when I'm there. 
I got you. Yeah. But we'll have to have you come out and okay. we'll have to get you some, some chicken tendies Let's and some it. of our Delta 8. We'll get you munchies and chicken oh, tendies, a match made in heaven. Speaking my language right now. Yeah. You know, you know, we got you. Um, what's something that you wish you could tell your, you could tell uh, Meg, Meg, younger Meg when she first moved here? You wish you knew when you moved? Um, hmm. You know, it's weird because like part of me feels like I wouldn't want to do anything different because I, I believe that everything happens for a reason. And if there's anything I know, tough lessons learned turn into good songs. So, you know, if I did everything perfectly, maybe I yeah. <laughs> maybe I wouldn't have written great songs because of it. Um, We've but, been just mental psyche, like moving yeah. to town and not really knowing anybody. I mean, I think it's like one of the things that that's tough when you when you first move here, like, you know, one to just be be patient and. And like you got to find that that fine line between going out and networking and like doing it too much. Like the first year that I was here, like I drank a lot. I went out a lot and it was it was a little too much at times. And it's like, you know, go out, but like leave by midnight instead of three. Or leave, by mid <laughs> four. leave by midnight's tough. You know, it, it is tough. But it's like just learning that like, yes, it's important that you go out and, and you network. Um, but. You, you got to like set some boundaries for yourself too, you know, cause also being out when you, when you get super drunk is not a good thing for you either. When you're trying, when you're around, like that's the other thing too, like wherever you are, there's a really good chance that half or more of the people in that bar work in the industry in some capacity. So don't act a fool because like you are, people are watching and people, it's a small town. It's a it is. small industry. People talk. Um, but I mean, I don't know. I think the other thing I would say too is like, when you get here it's really it's really overwhelming and intimidating because all of a sudden you are surrounded by some of the most talented people you've ever met and and really successful people and like you want that obviously and it can get easy to like get caught up trying to chase things that aren't for you you know like trying to chase a sound or a song or whatever because it worked for somebody else when the only thing you should be chasing is is who you are and yeah. how to be how to do something that only you can do, you know, because all all of the best, most successful artists that like become like icons, like there's nobody else that does what they do, you know, like a like an Eric Church or, or whatever, like that you just you got to find your own thing and not get distracted by what everybody else is doing, you know. Amen. That's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. There's something to be said for authenticity. And, and when I think of authentic people in Nashville, I think of yourself. I think uh, the rest of the bad bitches. And there's this wave of authenticity coming through right now that's really, really awesome. So, Meg, thanks so much for, for joining us and Absolutely. hopping on all the socials. It's what? Meg Patrick at pretty uh, much everything? Yeah, Meg, Meg Patrick Music for Instagram and Twitter and then Facebook. It's just my full name. Megan with an H, M E G H A N. Megan Patrick. with an H. There yep. you go. People always forget the H. Awesome. So. And make sure you guys check out her stuff on Spotify and Apple Music. Well, you guys, thanks for listening to another edition of the In the Round podcast. Um, big shout out to Meg Patrick for joining us today. Remember to check out the sponsors, uh, Whale Tail Media, Saxman Studios, and of course, our friends in the green world at Trailside CBD Emporium, that tasty, legal Delta 8 THC. Use promo code ITR at checkout. Save yourself 20% off. We'll see you all next time. This has been the In the Round Podcast.